What I just done read. Told you. Hello, greetings and salutations, and welcome back to What I Just Done Read. I think I've got it right this time. I'm pretty sure that on at least one of the previous episodes I've said what I've done just read. Sorry. Thank you for joining me again to find out what I have just done read. Before we do, we've got a couple of things to kind of go through first. So first off, uh, if you do like what we do here, then please do all the usual like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, uh, jump outside your house and run around it three times and say bibble. Don't. Don't. Don't do that. Uh, but if you do like what we do and you would like to see more of it, then please do consider becoming one of our patrons. To coincide with this episode coming out on the channel, we'll be adding another show to our patron-exclusive content, which is going to be called What I Just Done Read uh, Between Books. And this is a thing that I've done for several years, partly because I have so many books to get through, but also because after reading a novel or whatever my big read is, uh, I need something to just kind of clean my palette, as it were, and to do that I'll have an anthology of some type and I'll read a story or two from it. So what I thought would be quite nice to do is to, when I do that, do a shorter version of this, which will be just for our patrons. As I said, that will be going up on the channel for you guys at the same time as this episode comes out for everybody else. Before we get into our book for today, I will just turn to our password. Password? That's from the start of the show. Just our word of the day, which is uh, a lovely one, and it's been doing the rounds recently on memes and, and those kind of things, mostly targeted at writers and readers and things like that. And it's a lovely, lovely word, and the word is morbs. Not moobs. No moobs, thank you. Morbs. As I'm sure you can guess, Morbs is a truncation of morbid and was coined specifically for the Victorian phrase got the morbs, which was described as being in a state of temporary melancholia, which is just word porn in itself. But I've always really liked it. It seems appropriate to this time of year as we're getting close to, is it Blue Monday? It's called Blue Monday, isn't it? Third Monday of January. When you realise that the, that the holidays are over and you've got a whole other year of this ahead of you. Sorry. Um, but yes, but yes, do take Got to the Morbs and spaff it about as much as you like because it's a wonderful phrase. I believe it was coined around 18, late 1870s. I certainly know there was an article about it written in the 1880s. So do give it some love. Let us turn to the meat of why we are here, uh, which if you've seen the thumbnail, then you'll know. What I have just done read, and that is Apartment 16 by Adam Neville. If you saw the last episode, you'll know at the end of it, I did say that I was really looking forward to this one for a number of reasons. Partly because I was looking to get my teeth back into a proper novel, uh, something that was uh, slightly better written than the last book that I ro wrote. <laughs> that I wrote. <laughs> this may get cut out. It may not. We'll see. <laughs> but yes, the last book that I read, which if you want to know how that turned out, see last episode. This is the second of Neville's books that I have read, and ironically, this is the second of Neville's novels. Uh, this one actually precedes the other one that I've read, uh, The Ritual. It's one of those ones where I saw the film adaptation of The Ritual before I read the book, and I can highly recommend both. They do slightly different things with the stories, and what they do with it really suits their respective mediums. So really do check it out. And on the strength of that, I was interested in seeing some more of Neville's work, preferably some of his earlier work, see if I could spot any kind of emerging kind of signatures of him as a, as a writer, if you like. Curiously enough, uh, after having read this, 
I actually found there was more similarities in this to one of his later works, uh, No One Gets Out Alive, which I haven't read, but I have seen the Netflix adaptation, which came out around November time last year, I think. I'll touch on that a bit more in, in a bit. So as I did last time, I, I'll just give you a couple of small extracts from the blurb on the back, just to give you an idea of, of what the story is about. In Barrington House, an upmarket block in London, there is an empty apartment. No one goes in, and no one comes out. Until the night watchman hears a disturbance after midnight and investigates. And from the second paragraph, a young American woman, April, arrives at Barrington House. She's been left an apartment by her mysterious great-aunt, who died in mysterious circumstances. That should just give you enough of an idea of the setup for the story. I kind of caned it through this one pretty quickly, because... As, as a book, it, it, this doesn't fail to deliver. Very much on display is Neville's quite masterful talent for uh, drip-feeding his story to the reader, but in such a way that it doesn't leave you feeling alienated. You kind of get caught up and carried along with his narrative, and I'm quite happy for him to feed you the information that you need when he's ready to, and, that, and that, that, that's, that's really nice. The characters in it, as well, are very well realised, and considering the genre that this is, uh, they do at times make very intelligent decisions. The, the, the kind of decisions that, if you were watching this as a film go, you'd probably be sat there going, WHY DON'T YOU JUST DO THIS?! And then they do, and, and that's quite nice. It, it helps ground these characters and make them more believable. As a reader, it, it, it's something that you can only go, thank you, thank you, for not going down the, the Hollywood trope that you would expect in a horror film, where it's usually, especially kind of more modern horror films, a lot of the time, it's uh, terrible things happening to stupid people. That's not in evidence in, in Apartment 16. There are also in this some, what I think, when you look at Neville's later works, are some of the staples of his style, which would include a, a fascination and a love of abandoned and liminal spaces, and what could inhabit those spaces. Uh, it's something that I've always been fascinated with, just in general, but also myself as a writer as well I've been fascinated with, so seeing somebody else's interpretation of it is, is always most welcome. There's also, in certain cases with certain characters, there is a... They have a resistance to their fate or, or, or the specifics of the plot, which is, again, is very well realised, and again, helps to make these characters feel more alive. It makes it so much more of a page-turner, for, for me. I think I fell in love with the book on pages 32 and 33, uh, there's uh, a situation in place at the time. Uh, the character's emotional takeaway from what's happening is the same as uh, feelings that I had in a not dissimilar situation a few years ago. And that, for me, was uh, like, yeah, you, you can almost do no wrong now because uh, it's kind of the stuff that went through my head a few years ago and it's almost like somebody saying it back to you. And that, that was really nice. There is also some wonderfully disturbing imagery in here as well, which, having quite a, a visual imagination... <laughs> uh, there were a couple of nights where I had some very interesting dreams, uh, which, considering that a lot of what I've been doing recently, as a, again, as a, as a writer myself, has been very sort of dream-based. It's been a while since I've had any kind of really meaty dreams and reading this and then having that was like oh, oh, thank you thank you Adam thank you so much because uh, I'm never getting those nights back again thank you I mean they're kind of throughout the book but I'm the ones in particular that I'm thinking of are around about pages 104 105 through to about 107 um, are, are just uh, just uh, uh, are just perfect so, as I mentioned earlier, this is Neville's second full novel. His first book, 
uh, Banquet for the Damned, I think it's called. I'm not sure when that one came out, but I'm, I'm guessing around 2006. This was first published in 2010. Uh, apparently it took him about four and a half years to, to write it, and I read somewhere that he went through like 17 different iterations of it until he was happy. This edition came out in 2014. Uh, published by Pan Macmillan, who have something of an illustrious history when it comes to publishing horror. Uh, one of my old favourites is obviously the Pan books of horror stories, which I have almost a full set of. I need four more of the 30 to get. I don't really need to say much about the product itself. I mean, beyond that, I mean, as you can see, lovely, lovely spooky cover, decent font and typeface and everything, and thankfully no typos. I mean, I'm guessing this was a reissue because either the year, the same year as this came out or the year after, the ritual came out. And what I think is a nice thing is at the end, as a bit of a teaser, they've included the prologue and parts of chapter one of the ritual, just to kind of wet your whistle, as it were. That's a really good idea. I wish I'd have thought of it. As I mentioned at the start, I found more similarities in this to No One Gets Out Alive. And again, as I said, I haven't read that, that book. I've only seen the adaptation that was done on Netflix last year, which I watched at the time when I was reading this. And there's similarities there. The idea of the protagonist having to adjust to a, a new cultural setup as well as the events or the rather darker events of the story itself. They're, they're both in evidence there. Also, again, this idea of certain characters resisting their own role within the story, that's all there. And in, also, in particular, there's uh, a particular image uh, or an idea that turns up in No One Gets Out Alive that is almost perfectly encapsulated in, in this as well. If you look at the top two, three chapters of page 102 of this and the image that he's describing and then when you watch No One Gets Out Alive, and I wish I could remember the time code, if I can find it I will include it somewhere here. Uh, there's a particular image that is almost identical, um, or at least comes from the same source, if you see what I mean. Uh, and that got me thinking because I, I, I did wonder if that is in the book itself. I'm assuming that it must be. And if it is, I was wondering, is that something that Neville has done himself? It was an idea that he hadn't completely finished with and he wanted to revisit it? Or was it something that was kind of forced on him by his publishers? Because that book came out around 2016, 2017, which was around about the same time that Neville quit working with Pan Macmillan and went into self-publishing. Uh, a lot of the reasons for that apparently were to retain greater creative control over his work. So it did make me think, were they trying to force certain signatures on his work so they could market it better? I don't know, this is purely speculation, but it just got me thinking. That was all. That was all. Uh, I'd have to look at a lot more of his work to be able to say that this is definitely one of his tropes, if you like. Uh, because it's not something that I ever saw in evidence in the ritual. That's why I, I got thinking about it. Cons about the books, about the book itself? Um, only a couple, really. And they're, they're kind of minor things, and some of them I don't even agree with. Uh, when preparing for this, I did read a few reviews and watch a few reviews about the book and see what people have said um, before myself. And there was generally a feeling that they thought that the character of April uh, jarred in places. And I seem to get more of a, an idea that the suggestion was that it wasn't that it was a strong female lead written by a man. It was more to do with it being an American written by a Brit. Yeah. I personally didn't have, a, have any problem with that. I didn't even really notice it until I sort of watched a few reviews and then kind of studied it again and I was like yeah maybe but yeah it's it's a quibble at best what I found more was 
a couple of the subplots that are in the book could have used a bit more. They could go further, and they don't. And it's a real shame, because what is in here is very well realised. And you kind of left, well, I personally was left wanting a bit more of a payoff for those, which this doesn't provide. And that's about the only thing that I'd say that was a bit of a disappointment for me. The only other thing is very odd. It's page 149. And I understand the point of the text on the page. I understand how it fits into what's come, what goes before. But there's no natural segue into it. It really jars between the passages and the pages beforehand and what's on this page. So that when, and the fact that it never is really alluded to again, it feels like it was something that should have been taken out before it went to print. Again, that might be just me. I, I, I might be uh, missing the point on, on that. I love what it's saying, but it just... It's a bit clunky in how it relates to the surrounding text. I meant to say at the beginning, and I forgot, to, as a bit of a, uh, <laughs> a um, Chekhov's gun, but never mind. Uh, I do have a couple of things I want to say about this book, which will be good could be contrived as spoilers, uh, which I'm going to get into now. So if you don't want to watch this part, then please go to the time code below. You have been warned. Th they're nothing really, really major. There's just two very small points. One that's to do specifically with, with part of the story itself. On page 268, April says to somebody, I need to get into apartment 16. But as far as I'm aware, in none of the preceding 267 pages, does anyone ever tell her which apartment it is that is the source of all this trouble. And I'm 95% certain on that because I was invested in the story that much that I was waiting, you know, it was building up to that moment where somebody says to her, this is where it all starts. It started. And that doesn't happen. Unless I missed it, if I did, and you can point to it, then please uh, don't put it in the comments below, because obviously that's going to just compound the spoiler. Uh, send me a message to our Zadrum email address, which will be here, or is on the description, or find us on any of our social media, and just DM me and let me know so I can double check it, because as far as I could see, it never happens. The only other one that I was going to say, and this is more of a general thing for the story as a whole, uh, and if you are a horror fan, I'd be very surprised if you didn't spot this as well. Uh, and that's what this book overall feels to me, is it feels like a love letter to M.R. James's number 13. It doesn't take very long once you start reading the book to see the analogies between the two of them. And, that, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, other people have done it, and I'm sure other people will do it again. And Novel does it very well. But it's just a, a small point that, that I, th I thought was worth raising. In conclusion, would I recommend Apartment 16? I think from the tenor of everything that I've said up until now, yes, I would definitely recommend this book. If you'd never read the work that I mentioned in the spoiler section, you'd probably get more out of it. But either way, you will enjoy this book, and I highly recommend it. As always, I will put a link somewhere in the description to somewhere where you can pick up a copy. And I should probably say that we are not affiliated with any bookstore that I put a link to in our description. Uh, I'm simply doing that for the convenience of the viewer, so that if they do like it and they do want to go and have a look, bang, you can go straight to the bookstore and pick one up. The only thing that remains for me to do is to leave that there for a second while I go to the jar of eyes and get this one put in the book, which I've decided to take my eye ratings off this list because that's just going to get terribly complicated and put them on here instead. So over the course of the show, you can see this will build into a sea of slightly disturbing eyes that I can jiggle at you. 
Yeah. Enough of that. Uh, so I shall be back in two shakes of a lamb's tail, I think is the expression. Not three, because then we call social services. <laughs> And we are back, and ooh, a little bit of gag there. Uh, and we are back, and not surprisingly, Apartment 16 gets two huge eyes. So we can put this to one side, we can go to the list itself, and you can see I will now take that one off the list. And we can look at what's coming up next. And next we go back to my slightly uh, eclectic roots. This, I must admit, is going to be something a little bit of a cheat because it's more of what I've just done reread. But it's on the list, so here we are. And that is going to be Spirit by the great... 19th century French author Théophile Gautier. Spirit itself is actually a novella. But this also does include a short story, The Coffee Pot, as well. So you'll get two for the price of one. Yay! As always, with the best will in the world, you can leave me to my new read and get thee gone. Until next time. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me one second. I will shower myself in tea.